We're gonna take a look at collecting data. Um, so two kind of methods that we'll look at are observational studies where we make inferences from pre-existing situations. Um, an example, we can compare smokers and non-smokers uh, for their life expectancy. Uh, or we can have an experimental study uh, where we make inferences by controlling the groups and the variables. Um, so in the first case, we're not, or sorry, uh, which would be a, like a drug being tested on, uh, by giving it to one group and then a placebo to another. So in, an op in the observational study, we're not controlling the smokers and non-smokers. We're not saying, okay, you have to smoke, you don't smoke. We just find people that do and don't smoke and compare their life expectancy. Where in the experimental study, we're actually having people take the drug and other people not take the drug so that we can make an inference based on the control that we have there. Uh, when we're doing an experimental study, we often have what are called the treatment group, which is the guy, the, the people that get the uh, study happening to them. So in this case, giving them a drug uh, and then the control group, which don't get to do the study per se, but um, in this case could be like, you know, the guy's getting the placebo. So we're controlling uh, who's going, what's going on there, who gets the drug, who doesn't, and we're using that to study them. Um, experimental studies should be random. They should be repeatable so that we get the same results over time uh, and multiple, multiple studies. And that way there we know our data is valid. Uh, so for an example here, if a researcher interviews people as they leave the gym and finds they get fewer colds compared to people who do not go to the gym, Note the little change there. Um, why would this be an alt uh, observational study? So we're, people are walking out of the gym and the researcher is interviewing them and determines they get fewer colds compared to people who do not go to the gym. Well, there's no control over the people uh, that are part of this study here um, in terms of the number of colds or anything like that. So it's just who happens to get a cold and who doesn't. And we're not really randomizing our subjects because we're just picking people that are leaving the gym. So uh, there's no real control here. Um, and thus it would be an uh, observational study. So no control over those colds, observational study. Uh, what can be done to turn this study into an experimental study? Um, well, we need to get some sort of control group uh, as well. So perhaps we could include people not just going to the gym, but people that don't go to the gym as part of our study and uh, use that as a control. So simply that could cur uh, turn this in from an observational into an experimental study. Now, um, in the next case here, we have uh, a botanist uh, is studying the effects of acidity on the rate of growth. So she grows one, one group of plants using water with a neutral pH. She grows an, uh, each other group with increasingly acidic pH levels. So she has a group of plants, neutral pH, and then she has several other pH level, acidic pH levels, and groups of plants uh, each are each getting that. Um, what are the control and what are the treatment groups? So the control group would be the group with the neutral pH. And then the uh, treatment groups. Would be all the acidic pH groups. And then the second part here says, why do you think that uh, groups of plants were used rather than single plants at each pH level? By having numerous plants, um, we can help reduce the effect of other factors. So if we had just happened to have one sick plant at a certain pH, uh, you know, it, that wasn't, uh, that, that had some sort of defect in it, um, it would possibly skew a result and say, oh, that specific acidity causes this um, where the others don't. And it could just be because that one plant had some sort of issue. So having multiple plants allows us to eliminate um, 
that uh, helps us control that concern. Something like cat, it helps get rid of the variability of sick plants. All right, uh, another term that we need to look at is bias. Uh, so we kind of mentioned this and you should be familiar, but bias occurs when there's a prejudice for or against an idea or response. Could be caused by the sampling technique itself. Uh, we talked about that being things like, you know, uh, when you do a convenient sample or a voluntary sample, uh, especially, um, you know, people that have a certain feeling about something might be more apt to uh, respond than those who don't. Uh, you could also look at how the data is collected. So a question like, do you think schools should stop wasting time teaching students how to read? Right there, the question is bias because we are including the term wasting time. We should stop wasting time. We want people to think that teaching kids how to read is a bad thing and we're influencing that because we're using our own personal bias to say, hey, we think this is a waste of time and we want you to agree with us. Um, so you could easily fix that by just cutting out wasting time. So we cut that out. Do you think school should stop teaching kids how to read? Would be a more appropriate question. It would help remove some of the bias. Um, in the next case here, we got select the best fast food restaurant, Harvey's or Subway. What if you don't like either one? What if you think McDonald's is the best fast food restaurant or Wendy's or Burger King? You don't have uh, the option of selecting anything, only the specific options that were given to you. So you're creating bias by limiting options. So this question would be better um, by asking, what is the best fast food restaurant and then leaving a space for people to answer whatever they want. Then you can get all sorts of answers that you may not even have thought of as an option. If we take a look now at a survey here. So we have a survey and then we're gonna analyze it for some, uh, it's any concerns. So this is a school, a school feeling survey. We're asking for the name. We got some ages and the age, range here, age ranges here, uh, the person's gender. Um, and then first question, would you rather have the freedom to use your cell phone in class or be alone with no communication? And so the options are uh, self, having a cell phone or no cell phone. What's your favorite subject, math, English, or drama? Do you think it's important for students to attend church? Yes or no? Um, how do you feel about, uh, how do you like the new cafeteria menu? Is it pretty good, good, great, excellent, or awesome? Um, how do you like the new school logo and mascot? Do you like them or do you dislike them? So these are some uh, possible questions someone might put in a survey about the school. And now let's look at some, uh, let's look at this in terms of these questions here. The survey is not anonymous, and so we want to know, could that influence the responses? So if you don't have a uh, anonymity in the survey, if people have to give their name, they might respond differently because they might not want to um, influence the survey or say, surveyor or let people know their own personal feelings. If I gave a survey out saying, how many of you think math is the best class ever? Um, or even if it was a proper question of, do you enjoy math? If you rate, some people may rate it higher, giving it the response to me because I'm a math teacher. Where if you could do it anonymously, it might inf allow, influence you to answer more openly uh, in terms of your response. So yes, it could. So people not, might not want their uh, their opinions identified uh, to them. Some people feel they might, someone might use it against them, something like that. 
Uh, are the ages clear? Can they be written? Is age important to know? So if we look here, uh, the ages are 10 to 12, 12 to 16, and over 16. Uh, they're not really that clear. Um, 10 to 12 is fine, but then we have 12 to 16. So if I'm 12 years old, which box do I choose? Over 16 is fine, because now I got 12 to 16 and then over 16, but um, it doesn't really give me a good uh, choice in terms of uh, 12 year olds. So you might change that and change 12 to 16 to perhaps 13 to 16. So then we have 10 to 12, 13 to 16, and then over 16. Is it important to know the age? Um, it possibly could be. Uh, in, the, in terms of this, uh, looking at what you know your grade nines, grade tens, grade elevens, grade twelves, and different grades, grade levels think uh, could be important. So age would be, uh, age could be important to know here. But you don't need to ask age, just ask age. Make sure it has some relevancy here. So um, age might not even be the best choice. Maybe grade level is the better choice here. Uh, and then using that to determine uh, how people think could be maybe the better option. Uh, is the gender question written properly? Now, traditionally, yes, it's perfectly fine. You would select male or female. However, uh, we are more culturally sensitive and uh, social and uh, sensitive to gender. So putting male, female uh, can cause issues and can upset some of your survey takers uh, in uh, current society. So you would want to change that um, to, if you need to know the gender, then either just ask straight out gender and leave a space for them to identify however they want. Um, where this can lead to issues is when you have someone giving you poor survey answers or trying to be funny, and we've had that uh, in the past. So another option is to do um, do your check boxes. So you have male, you can have female, uh, but then you could also have um, something like other, or you could have uh, choose not to. Uh, Choose not to identify, variety of options there. Um, but this one here, gender question now, uh, does need to be thought about when you are writing a survey. Do you need it? And then how can you effectively do it so that you will not um, upset someone who feels that their gender uh, is not binary like male or female? Um, are there any leading questions? And if so, rewrite them. So if we take a look at our survey, would you rather the freedom to use your cell phone in class or be alone with no communication? Well, obviously I want my cell phone. I don't want to be alone, but that's because I want, I'm, I'm encouraging you to make that decision. I want you to choose cell phones because I don't want you to feel alone because that would be the feeling I, that you're, I expect you to have if you don't have a cell phone. Uh, so that one is very leading. Um, so how could we take that question um, and rewrite it? This whole question needs to go and could just then change to something like should cell phones be allowed in class? That there would remove any um, influence on that. Um, in terms of um, the third one as well, do you think it's important for students to attend church? Yes or no? That becomes um, a fairly biased question as well. Um, it's religion is um, is a 
difficult question to uh, to bring into school feelings. Um, so, do should students attend church? Maybe in a, a Catholic school, uh, this might be appropriate, but in a public uh, school setting, um, not all people uh, with a faith attend church. They attend uh, different types of religious services and things like that. So this question here, the best thing for it, uh, rather than even rewrite it, would just be to remove uh, it entirely. Or um, if you are concerned about that, do you think it's important for students to have uh, practice their uh, practice a faith? Um, perhaps could be a a question, but it is a very uh, difficult question and probably inappropriate for this survey. Um, last bit here: Are there any limiting questions? Rewrite them. What's your favorite subject? Math, English, or drama? Uh, very limiting question. Uh, what about all the other subjects that we have available to us? Easily rewritten, scratch off the check boxes. What's your favorite subject? You put it down, pick your own. Um, how do you like the new cafeteria menu? Is it pretty good, good, great, excellent, awesome? What if you don't like it? You could choose pretty good, but pretty good says that like it's not bad. So you aren't giving the uh, students an option there as well. So this might be a bad question. You could change this perhaps to a scale uh, of you know like to dislike or something like that. Um, that might be a better option. Or just let them put a comment in there um, that would really give them an option to say, I like the new um, burgers they serve, but I don't like the new uh, salad dressing options. That would actually give them a lot more option to, or opportunity to provide their opinions. Uh, same with the last question here. How do you like the new school logo and mascot? If I like the logo but not the mascot or vice versa, I don't have an option to say one or the other. I have to say I either like them or dislike them both, um, which then limits my options. So again, uh, you could cut that and say, what are your thoughts on the new school logo uh, and mascot where they could be more descriptive? Separate them into uh, two questions would also be another option there. So you really want to spend some time if you're ever having to write a survey to analyze what's the best option for this survey, what questions are there, and are, am I presenting any bias in those questions?